Hello, everybody. And today, what we're going to focus on is the spread of communism after World War II. So this is topic 8.4. This is the fourth topic in the unit. We've already dealt with four of the eight topics related to this unit. So this one we're going to focus on because it's going to bring in a lot of information you may not be familiar with. So the first area that we're going to look at with the spread of communism is the spread of communism into China. So we're going to focus on communist China for the next couple of slides, going from 1949 to the present. However, for our lecture, we're going to kind of cut it right around 90, 1980. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to remind you of the Chinese Civil War that had been going on from the 1920s, the 1930s, and continued through the 1940s. And this pitted two groups against each other, the KMT, or what we call the Kumatang Party. We can also call this group the Nationalist Party. Now, just to refresh your memory, the Kumatang Party was an offshoot, um, well, was actually the party that engaged in the revolution of 1911 under Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And a lot of the goals of the Kumatang Party, they were a nationalist party, but they also favored modernization, and they also favored bringing in the Western ideas of industrialism and creating a more modern state of China. So the Kumatang was very much big supporters of the May 4th movement, um, but the Kumatang also had kind of an authoritarian bent to it, especially after the leader Chiang Kai-shek took over. The CCP is the Chinese Communist Party. And the Chinese Communist Party also grows out of the May 4th movement. And both of these parties have something in common. They wanna move China into the modern age. But where they differ is what that future will look like. The Chinese Communist Party wants a communist system in place. The other thing is that the Chinese Communist Party believes that the peasants are critical to a communist revolution. And there's a big emphasis on the role that the peasants will play in ushering in a communist state. Now, when we look at number one, the impact of World War II, as I mentioned, this civil war really began in 1927 when the Kuomintang attacked the Chinese Communist Party in the April purges. This led to the Chinese Communist Party engaging in what's called the Long March. And this is kind of your early civil war. And then if you recall from 1937, China has to deal with Japan. Japan invades in 1937. And when Japan invades, essentially the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party call a truce. They don't necessarily work together, but they don't work against each other. And both of them focus their energies on driving out the Japanese. Now there's still fighting going on between these two groups periodically during World War II, but most of their attention is focused on Japan. When we get to 1945 and Japan has been conquered, the KMT and the CCP pick up the, the, the civil war once again. Now, during this period of time, the Chinese communists is becoming increasingly popular amongst the peasant class. The Chinese communists, as they roll through China and take land from landowners, they redistribute that land to the peasants. They also are viewed as less corrupt than the Kumatang party. And they're seen as a party that is trying to help the peasants rather than trying to conquer them or trying to control them. So pretty soon, 90% of the population of China is mostly lined up by the, behind the Communist Party. And in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party takes control of China. Now in 1949, that's an important year for Chinese history is that's when the communists come to power and the People's Republic of China is born. So today we still read the technical name for China is the People's Republic of China. And it is a one party state, the Communist Party, and the initial leader from 1949 to his death in about the mid 70s will be a man by the name of Chairman Mao or Mao Zedong. So that's a name that you're going to want to be familiar with. It's one of the bigger names in modern history. So Chairman Mao is going to become the central leader of China and the central leader of the Chinese Communist Party going forward. Meanwhile, the Kumatang Party, which has been defeated, they have to leave China and they go to Taiwan and they form what's called the Republic of China. 
And from 1949 to about 1972, Taiwan is recognized by the United States and other Western nations as the legitimate China. And you have Taiwan intermingling with the Republic of China's identity. And that's gonna create some tensions between the native Taiwanese and the Chinese who have come into Taiwan. So today, when we look at how Taiwan views itself as an independent state of China, and China views itself, it views Taiwan as a rogue province, and there's tensions between Taiwan and China over that very issue, that's where it all stems from. So that sets us up for 1949. Now we want to look at what the communists do once they're in power. And they do what communist parties do. They engage in economic planning. So one of the things they do early on is to establish a five-year plan. So the five-year plan is geared towards heavy industrialization, a focus on increasing the production of steel, coal, more heavy industry rather than consumer goods. But we saw the same thing with Stalin in the Soviet Union. So during this period of 1953 to 1958, there is Soviet aid coming into communist China. And we see Mao Zedong trying to rapidly industrialize China. Number two, which is the second five-year plan, it only lasts four years, is the one you really do need to pay attention to. And that's called the Great Leap Forward. So the Great Leap Forward is just that. It's an attempt to make China leap forward as an industrial power in the world. And is trying to leap China forward in terms of its productivity and in terms of its um, modernization. One of the keys to this program is commune farming. So just like the Soviet Union, who collectivized land under the government, China is going to collectivize the land under the Chinese government and establish communes for the Chinese peasants to cultivate the land. Now, the problem is, is that there are going to be resistors. There's going to be people who protest the, these changes. And what Mao Zedong does is he establishes re-education camps. Now, I hope you understand that this is a euphemism. You know, basically, re-education camps are internment camps for political dissidents. And through physical and mental stress, um, through mental manipulation, through physical um, torture, there is an attempt to convince these dissidents to get on board with the communist program. There's heavy labor, there's psychological uh, manipulation, there's physical punishment, basically all the horrors that you can imagine that come out of a totalitarian state. And if you became re-educated in the eyes of the government, you would be released back into the, the society. If you didn't become re-educated, if you didn't comply, you would be killed. So the idea of these re-education camps, really that's a euphemism for basically internment camps or concentration camps where political dissidents were concentrated into one area to break them or to kill them. And today we see re-education camps still being used within by the Chinese government. The, the Uyghurs out in Western China who are, there's, a number of re-education camps, and I put that in quotes. And as you watch the upcoming Olympics, there's gonna be more and more talk about whether or not Western countries can really go and participate in these type of Olympics when China is engaged in this, these, these series of violations of human rights. And when I say China, I'm really talking about the Chinese communist government. Now, the next thing that we wanna to come to is that there's an agricultural component of the Great Leap Forward because there has to be increased productivity to support the working class. Same thing that happened in the five-year plans. And the productivity doesn't happen the way that Mao Zedong wants. So one of the things they do is they engage in the four pests campaign. And if you take a look over at the poster on the left, you'll see a sword that goes through, I believe it's a fly, a mosquito, um, a sparrow, and a rat. And the idea was to kill those four creatures because the, the government said the reason why the harvest fails is because these four pests are constantly feeding on our crops. Now, 
killing these pests become a nationwide campaign. Publicity posters like this are all over the place. Children take out slingshots and try to take down sparrows. There's even cases of children banging pots, you know, so that the sparrows can never stay in one spot. They can never rest in the tree. And literally, the sparrows die of exhaustion and just drop out of the sky. The sparrow or the four pest campaign was so successful, a number of millions of sparrows are killed. And as a government orchestrated campaign, people were given um, rewards for rat tails that they brought in or for dead sparrow bodies. This was a significant campaign. But what it does is it eliminates um, animals who would eat locusts and keep um, things that really destroyed crops at bay. So when these animals are killed off, particularly the sparrow, locust waves start to increase, which devastate the crops even more. So in the end, this four pest campaign contributes to the agricultural problems rather than solves them. The other thing is that for the Chinese party, the Communist Party, um, for the Communist Party, they don't want to appear to be failing. It's very important that it looks like they're succeeding. So what Mao Zedong will do is continue to export grain and rice to the international community instead of feeding his own population because he doesn't want the export numbers to drop, which would signal, uh, signal they drop in production. So what he does is he maintains the exporting levels and he denies basically the citizenry or the peasant class the food. And as a result, we get a widespread famine that probably accounts for about 20 million, um, 20 million deaths, possibly more. And when you think of the five-year plans in the Soviet Union, we talk about the famine that took place within the Ukraine, we see the same thing happening here in China during the Great Leap Forward. 1962, the Great Leap Forward was abandoned, but other policies are gonna be coming about that we'll see kind of a heavy-handed approach in China. One of these policies is the Sino-Soviet split of 1960. Basically, China and the Soviet Union became, become antagonists. They, they become rivals instead of allies. And this has to do with border disputes. This has to do with the desire of Mao Zedong to be independent of Moscow and not have to follow Moscow's lead in everything. So that split is gonna separate the Chinese and the Soviet Union from one another. You would think that there would be natural allies and in the 1950s they were, but in the 1960s we have this break that lasts for quite a while. Um, then we have the Cultural Revolution. So in 1966, Mao Zedong, he says, we need to reignite the revolutionary spirit in the people. We need the revolution, he says, is not a dinner party. It is a constant violent upheaval and a challenge of our society so that we can perfect the communist ideal. So the cultural revolution is going to battle the four olds, old ideas, old culture, old habits, and old customs. And if you look at the poster on the left, you see a member of the Red Army the Chinese Red Army, um, or the Red Guard, I apologize, the Red Guard taking a hammer. And if you look closely enough at the poster, you will see um, little statues of, of the Buddha. You'll see um, records that would have been coming from Western society. You would see traditional Chinese customs. You would also see Western customs. And the Chinese basically reads as destroy the old world, forge a new one. So that's the idea behind the Cultural Revolution was this encouragement to get rid of anything that was holding the communist revolution back. And what was seen as holding the communist revolution back was anything associated with the old ways, the ways before the communists took over. Now we don't actually know the exact number of people who were persecuted and killed during this Cultural Revolution. Basically, anybody who did not conform to Mao Zedong's com communist vision was an enemy of the state and was persecuted, re-educated, executed. Uh, there are even cases in some provinces of cannibalism over this movement. And the Red 
army or the Red Guard got so out of control enforcing this communist idea that even Mao Zedong eventually had to condemn their actions. However, in the 10 years, there are some estimates of hundreds of thousands of Chinese who die. There's even estimates into the tens of millions. We just don't know because the records aren't necessarily there to tell us. A lot of time, the, the information is kept quiet by local communist officials. The other policy to be aware of is that Mao Zedong in communist China maintains an isolation of China from the West in the 1950s and the 1960s. So you have this idea that here's this, this communist nation that shuts itself off from the West. And the West is shutting itself off from communist China as well. If you go back to the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China, the United States was only doing business with the Republic of China. In the 1950s, the US only recognized Taiwan as the legitimate China. And they looked at the People's Republic of China as an illegitimate government. So you have this idea that the West and China have basically cut ties to one another. And that goes throughout the 1950s and the 1960s. In 1972, President Nixon visits China. And this begins the opening of relations between China and the United States, a complicated relationship that is still going on today. It's, it's one that is fraught with a great deal of competition, but also trade agreements and a lot of back and forth. Of, of goods and ideas. So you have this idea that China, in a way China represents, well not in a way, China represents an authoritarian nation that is run by a single party, the Communist Party. That comes to power in 1949 and essentially that reality has not changed. Meanwhile, here you have the United States that's a democratic nation that is multiple parties. And you have two different competing views of the world. And yet these two, you know, our biggest trading partner is China. So there's a complex relationship that's going to develop after 1972 that we're still seeing play out today. So the second part of this topic deals with land reform movements. So I'm going to talk about some different countries. And the idea is that communism or socialism emphasizes this idea of redistribution of wealth. And redistributing land to the peasant class becomes a rallying cry of communist parties, socialist parties. You know, it, it's seen as a reform after World War II that has to get done. So I'm gonna spend a little time in Iran and then I'll talk briefly on some other examples. But all of the examples I'm about to go through are land reform movements. In Iran, just to give you a little history, there's been a lot of changing of leadership in Iran starting in World War II. In World War II, the leader of Iran declared his support for Nazi Germany, but pledged neutrality. Britain and Russia could not handle Iran supporting the Nazi vision while being neutral. So Britain and Russia are gonna to work together to force the leader of Iran out and to give power to his son Shah Mohammad Reza um, Pahlavi. Yeah, the Shah, we'll just call him the Shah. And the Shah becomes kind of Britain and Russia's main guy. 1951 to 1953, the people of Iran want the Shah out because to them, the Shah is nothing more than a puppet leader of the West. And it, there's a coup d'etat that overthrow the Shah and a democratically elected Mohammed uh, Mossadegh. Oh God, Mossad Day Day Mossade. Mohammed Mossade, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, comes to power. So here's this democratically elected prime minister who takes over Iran. He wants to nationalize the oil industry, and that's something that the United States and Britain do not like at all. They don't wanna see this type of socialist slash communist approach to something as important as oil. So the US and the Britain work together to carry out a coup of Mohammed uh, Mossadegh and bring back the Shah, bring back Shah Mohammed 
Reza Palap. And from 1953 to 1979, the Shah is going to be an authoritarian ruler of Iran, and he's going to have a close relationship with the Western powers of the United States and Britain. During this time, the Shah engages in a policy called the White Revolution. It's not named white because of ethnicity, but rather because it is bloodless. And the biggest thing is that he engages in a land redistribution program where the government buys the land from the wealthy landowners and then sells it to the peasants at a fraction of the cost. Now, this land redistribution program will have some success. You will have new property owners emerging who are able to buy the land much cheaper than before. However, this doesn't extend to everybody. Property owners feel like they're being pushed to give up their land to the government. There are some peasants who get no land whatsoever. And there's going to be Muslim leaders who feel that Iran is modernizing and getting away from its Islamic roots. We'll talk about that in a second. But the other part of the white revolution is that voting rights are gonna be extended for women. There's gonna be literacy programs brought into the villages and social welfare systems to support the, the lower class is gonna be brought in. So when you look at the white revolution, you do see these reforms and policies that we would classify as, as getting away from traditional practices. And that's what brings me to letter C is in Iran, opposition movements are gonna to form to the Shah. Some of the opposition, as I mentioned before, are peasants who didn't benefit from the land program. Some of it is gonna be property owners who feel like their land has been taken away from them. But a big group is gonna be a religious faction who feels that giving rights to women um, you know, bringing in social welfare, these land reforms represent a break from Islamic tradition within Iran. And if you really pull back and you remember the Safavid dynasty that we had studied a long time ago, the Safavid dynasty, you know, had its roots in a very strong allegiance to Shia Islam. And now here we are in 1960s and another group who is passionately supportive of traditional Islamic ways is emerging as an opposition to the Shah. In 1979, these opposition groups will overthrow the Shah and they will create a theocracy. A theocracy means that the religious leaders run the country. And the, the emergence of a religious leadership in Iran is gonna fundamentally change Iran. And Iran is going to be based, this new Iran, it's going to have a strong anti-Western sentiment. They're going to see the United States and Britain as imperialist powers trying to exert greater and greater control. So when we leave Iran in 1979, we have a strong religious leadership that has displaced the Shah. We have a strong sense of anti-Western sentiment. And we have an Iran that is very supportive of Shi'i Islam. And when you look at today's conflicts, in a lot of ways, Iran is trying to exert its influence throughout the Middle East and it basically establish a greater power of Iran throughout the Middle East. And that's basically where we are today. So the next slide is gonna be kind of quick examples. And the thing you wanna understand is all of these examples engage in land reform. And land reform, taking land from private citizens and redistributing it to a poor class of peasants, that is socialism and communism. That's a redistribution of wealth. And the wealth in this case is measured in land. So there's gonna be different degrees of socialism. In Venezuela in 2001 under Hugo uh, Chavez, you're gonna have a land redistribution practice uh, where there's an attempt to take land and redistribute it to, to poor peasants or landless peasants. That comes with a lot of mixed results and a great deal of controversy. And if you follow anything going on in Venezuela, you know that a lot of this wealth redistribution is going to set up for problems later. And it's going to set up the political chaos and political instability. 
But one that I want to bring your attention to is Guatemala. From 1951 to 1954, there is a socialist in power named Arbenz. And Arbenz is the president, prime minister. He's the leader of the government. And he's going to work closely with communist leaders. And he's going to develop a land plan to redistribute land. And if you look over at this, um, this, this I don't know, billboard, um, it says, the president, Arbenz, um, tells the peasant, um, here is your land. Defend it, cherish it, cultivate it. And what he wants, what he sees himself as giving the people the land. Now, there's a business in Guatemala. It's been there since 1899. They go back to imperialism, the United Front Fruit Company. So the United Fruit Company is a big um, exporter of bananas. They make a lot of money off of having access to a lot of land and being able to keep labor very cheap. So the United Fruit Company, which is an American business, looks at President Arben's plan and they go, this is not good for us. This is gonna end up screwing us over. We'll lose land in this process. So they begin to lobby the United States to intervene. And in 1953, 1954, the United States, um, under an operation carried out by the CIA, is going to ferment a coup d'etat of President Arbenz. And what's going to happen is they're going to overthrow the president. Eventually, he's just going to have to leave the country. And the CIA is instrumental to orchestrating that coup, along with members of the Guatemalan uh, military and forcing this, this communist leaning leader out. And that brings me back to the Cold War, which is a big topic of Unit 7, or sorry, Unit 8, is that the Cold War, you have this idea that the United States is looking to keep communism at bay. So when they see Guatemala's actions, they see communism spreading and they intervene and they basically get a change to government or a change in government that favors U.S. interests. Particularly the United Fruit Company is very happy with the change because their business can keep on going without government interference. In Vietnam, we'll talk more about Vietnam when we talk about decolonization, but after World War II, Vietnam is gonna um, be led by a group called the Viet Cong who is led by a man named Ho Chi Minh. And the Viet Cong are a communist party. They're also a nationalist party. They wanna get rid of the European influence. So in 1954, there's a fight against the French to kick out the French. And then this communist party, based out of the North, begins a process of taking land from wealthy landowners and redistributing it to the peasants. Now, you know that as North Vietnam extends into South Vietnam, that leads to American intervention, and that's the Vietnamese War. And over time, this Communist Party, by 1975, this Communist Party will have taken all of Vietnam under their control. And this land reform has been implemented to distribute land amongst the peasants. In Ethiopia in 1974, this is kind of a complicated story, but to make it short, there's an Ethiopian leader who many people see as a Western puppet. Again, we come back to this idea that there's this anti-Westernism going on and rulers who had a close relationship with the West were becoming suspect and they were becoming vulnerable to coup d'etats and overthrows and revolutions. And communist parties within these regions of Asia and Africa and Latin America played an anti-American, anti-Western card. Basically, they used anti-imperialism to advance communism. And in Ethiopia, the leader of Ethiopia is overthrown in 1974, and in his place comes a communist uh, leader, Menjistu Hali Meriam. Uh, sure. So his leadership, he declares himself to be friendly to communism. So now the Soviet Union starts to pour in money into Ethiopia. And under his leadership from 1974 to 1991, there are land redistributions. There's efforts to redistribute land amongst the peasants. 
efforts for government supported cultivation of the land, but these failed miserably leading to a widespread famine that Ethiopia often gets associated with. When I was growing up, you know, 1974 is when I was born, 1991 was the year before I graduated high school. And when you said Ethiopia to me, all I knew was a country in famine because that's what we knew of Ethiopia. Of course, now that I study history, I understand there's a bigger picture here. I didn't really understand the role the government played in mismanaging the agricultural sector of the economy that contributed to the famine. There was certainly a widespread drought, but there was also government mismanagement that made the problem worse. And then lastly, in India, India is gonna get its freedom after World War II, and they're gonna engage in land reform. And the land reform that we really wanna focus on is in Kerala. Kerala, I believe, is in the Southwest part of India. And from 1960 to 1970, this little region state, if you will, think of it as a, as a small state within the bigger nation. Kerala is gonna engage in a series of land reforms that is gonna end feudalism and increase ownership of land by former landless peasants. So it used to be that there are tenant farmers who paid rent to the big landowners. What Corella does is they get rid of that feudalistic system. They get rid of the big landowners and they allow the tenant farmers to be able to purchase the land and own the land outright. There is mixed results with this, but that is an example of a land reform that is somewhat successful. So there you have it. You have topic 8.4 all done, focusing on the, the spread of communism in the China and the land reform movements in India, um, Ethiopia, Vietnam, Latin America, particularly Guatemala and Venezuela, as well as Iran. And that right there, we're done with another topic of Unit 8. All we have left is decolonization. So until then, I will see you later. Bye.